Okay, everybody, welcome to lab number two, where we're going to continue with the tissues, tissues part two, and the integumentary system. So let's begin with our other two types of tissue, which are connective tissue, a lot of different varieties there, and nervous tissue, essentially only one look that you're responsible for knowing here in the lab. So what we will do, as we did in lab number one, I will show you actual micrographs of these tissues. And I'll attempt, with the connective tissues, to show you maybe one or two different appearances for each one. Some students, once in a while, run into a problem of saying, hey, Duane, all the tissues look the same. Well, they actually don't. There are differences, and what you have to focus on are the distinct differences between one connective tissue and the next. So be very particular, be very detail-oriented when you make your drawing, when you look at these tissues, to look for those things that make, say, this one look different from other connective tissues. Generally speaking, many of them get stained some shade of red, not all, but many of them do. So you want to be careful with that and focus on some of these details, how these tissues look different from one another. So let's start with this one, which happens to be areolar connective tissue. Okay, maybe a little less focusing on me and a little more focusing on the tissue since you don't really need to see me. In fact, some of you are probably thinking, I see enough of him already. So, let's pay a little bit of attention to this particular tissue. Our first connective tissue called areolar connective tissue, sometimes called loose irregular connective tissue. Also, you may see that as well, but for our purposes, we'll go with areolar connective tissue. Areolar, making reference to this tissue, goes around a lot of things. This tissue very commonly found packaging your organs, surrounding your muscles. In fact, many of you have probably seen this one if you have ever, say, skinned a chicken breast or even prepared a boneless, skinless chicken breast, you may have seen that tissue that comes off the top of the chicken breast, looks sort of cottony, you can separate it away from the muscle with your finger or even something like a butter knife. That's this stuff, areolar connective tissue. Sometimes called a loose connective tissue because you can see lots of space between the fibers, irregular because the fibers run in many different directions. But it has all the characteristics that we expect to see in a connective tissue. Unlike epithelium or muscle tissue, in a connective tissue, the field of view is dominated by the extracellular matrix, the fibers, the protein-like gel, the other material, the fluid that might be out here, not the cells. In fact, the cells, which I can see here and here and here, are widely spaced from one another. This is common in a connective tissue. So we're dominating the field with the extracellular matrix, in this case fibers. The red thick ones you see, these are collagen fibers. And you say, I know, Duane, you just told us this tissue looks white when we see it. Well, collagen fibers are very white until you stain them. So these have been stained by a technician using a red stain so that you could see them against the white background. So this is why the fibers look stained here. So the thick collagen fibers, thin elastin fibers, but for you, as a lab student, what can I ask you about this particular slide? First, as always, I could say, name the tissue, areolar connective tissue. Next, I could say, give me the general type of tissue shown here, connective tissue. 
And in boldface with this tissue, what could I ask you? Name the cell indicated, which is a cell that actively makes fibers, a fibroblast. I could also ask you to identify one, one only location where this tissue can be found in the human body. Your lab manual lists three for this one. You just have to pick one of those. Within the dermis, between the muscles, around the blood vessels and nerves, amongst a whole bunch of other places too. But remember, for your lab quiz, you must use one of these functions that's listed in your student lab manual. Don't find one somewhere else, don't use one from somewhere else. Areolar connective tissue. A little memory trick that I tell my students to use all the time is I think this looks like a little microscopic view of a bunch of hair. Thick hairs, collagen, thin hairs, elastin. So I call this hairiolar connective tissue. That's just a little memory trick that I use. Do not write that on your quiz. Do not select that from your quiz. It does look sort of like a little mob of hair. For somebody who, let's say, has a lice problem, the fibroblasts here would be lice. So, areolar connective tissue. Let me show you one other view of this same tissue. Okay, here's another perfectly reasonable view of areolar connective tissue. In this preparation, you can see that the fibroblasts stand out a little bit more. I can see the elastin and collagen fibers. So what's the name of this tissue? Areolar connective tissue. What's the type of tissue I see here? Connective. Where do I find it? Within the dermis between the muscles, packaging or around my blood vessels, areolar connective tissue. Here we have a very nice view of our second tissue, adipose. Adipose tissue, fat, dominated by relatively large cells. I can just happen to see a blood vessel here another one here in this slide, but these cells, the adipose cells, are actually filled with a very large lipid vacuole, remember lipids, fats, oils, and waxes, that push the nuclei of the cells all the way over to the edge because it's filled up by this one giant vesicle, essentially. This tissue is very difficult to see sometimes on a microscope slide because all you have are these thin cell membranes visible, but it always looks to me sort of like a collection of chicken wire, perhaps the honeycomb in a beehive. I had a professor once years ago that taught a group of us how to identify certain trees that we would see. It was a tree taxonomy class. I'm a biology nerd. And I remember him telling us that one species of tree, a silver maple, he called it a 60 mile an hour tree, meaning it was so easy to identify, you could be driving down the highway at 60 miles an hour and still recognize what species of tree it is. I always think of this one as a 60 mile an hour tissue. This is the one and only look that adipose has. You're not going to see it looking any different than this. So great big giant cells that appear to be empty, normally in the slide preparation, the lipids are gone here, but always this honeycomb, always this sort of chicken wire appearance. Adipose. What type of tissue is it? Connective tissue. Where can I find it? I find it just under the skin in the hypodermis. Where else do I find it? Surrounding the kidneys, surrounding the eyeballs, and it does form our yellow bone marrow. Adipose tissue. Only looks like this. Okay, what we're looking at here is our next connective tissue. Notice, like most connective tissues, dominated by extracellular matrix, cells widely spaced, 
In fact, adipose is one of the only few connective tissues that doesn't show widely spaced cells, but still considered a connective tissue because of its embryonic origin and the fact that it packages organs and connects things. But this one is reticular connective tissue. A very, very traditional look of it. And what I can see, if you look closely, go ahead and pause me, are these very small fibers, these very small, essentially, versions of collagen, which are reticular fibers, making up this tissue. This happens to be a micrograph of a lymph node, which is one of your locations for this particular connective tissue. You can often see these little bundles of reticular fibers like you see here, as well as individual reticular fibers, oftentimes stained some sort of bluish, violet, or purple color seems to be the most common staining pattern for this particular tissue. So name the tissue, reticular connective tissue. Where can I find it? A lymph node, your red bone marrow, your liver, your spleen like that, pick one of them from your lab manual. Reticular fibers often occurring in bundles. Let me show you another view of this same tissue. Okay, here's another slide of reticular connective tissue and I can see a lot of these individual fibers. I selected this view because you can see some of them split apart here. Name the tissue, reticular connective tissue. What type of tissue is it? Connective. One location in the human body? Lymph node, liver, spleen, red bone marrow. Reticular connective tissue. I think it has a very distinctive look when you notice these bundling of reticular fibers. This tissue famous in these organs for forcing a liquid, in this case lymph, to slow down as it moves through all these fine little network of reticular fibers. You'll talk about that in your lecture. Remember for lab, it's just the appearance of the stuff. What does it look like? Name it, name the type, one location. This is a very nice, very characteristic view of our next connective tissue, dense regular connective tissue. It's called dense because all the fibers are very close to one another. It is called regular because the fibers all basically run in the same direction. Contrast this with our first tissue that you saw in lab today, areolar, which is sometimes called loose or irregular. So areolar was loose, the fibers were not this tightly packed. It was irregular because they were pointing every which away. Here, the fibers are close together, dense. The fibers generally run in the same direction, regular. These are the cells, the fibroblasts and fibrocytes that made these fibers. These pinkish red things are collagen fibers all essentially running in the same direction. Now, when you look at this tissue, it would be not unheard of for a person to confuse this tissue with one that we saw in our first lab, skeletal muscle. I'll grant you there's a little bit of a similar appearance, but notice first no vertical stripes or striations. I could play with the fine adjustment knob on this fancy microscope, trust me, all day long, and I will never see any striations because collagen fibers are not striated. So I will never see the striations. I would if it was skeletal muscle fibers. The other thing is, once in a while people confuse the fibroblasts here with the multinucleate appearance of skeletal muscle fibers, notice these things exist between these collagen fibers, not inside 
skeletal muscle cells. So dense, regular connective tissue. If I think of areolar connective tissue as hariolar connective tissue, it's not that much of a stretch to see this as a micrograph of, say, wavy hair. Hair that has small curls in it. Hair that has been permed. Uh, since it's stained a reddish color and I just happened to have streamed the undoing, mystery, I won't spoil the mystery, no spoilers, but th this is Nicole Kidman's hair. How's that? So, I see these waves in dense regular connective tissue. So, name the tissue, dense regular connective tissue. Name the type, connective. Where do I find it? Everybody goes with tendons or ligaments. So tendons and aponeuroses and your ligaments. I'll go back to my idea of a chicken breast. I said that we had areolar connective tissue on the outside of this breast meat. This is what you would see for those of you who cook. You fall into one or two camps, I know. That white slippery thing that's in the chicken breast, you're either in the I have to remove it before I cook the chicken camp, or you are in the I don't care, I'm just going to leave it in there. It's a protein, it'll denature when I cook the stuff anyhow. This is what you're looking at there. This is a tendon that you see. Collagen fibers are often called white fibers because they're white before they've been stained. This is what a tendon or a ligament looks like with varying degrees of elastin fibers mixed in depending on which one you see. So, dense regular connective tissue. Again, don't confuse it with skeletal muscle. They're not the same. This one has no striations or stripes in it. Let's take a look at a different view. Okay, another nice view of the same tissue, fibers running in the same direction, tightly packed together, tendons, ligaments, dense, regular connective tissue. Notice this one doesn't look anything at all like adipose, doesn't look anything at all like reticular or areolar connective tissue. So don't go telling me or your lecture professors that the tissues all look the same because I'm showing them to you they don't all look the same. This one is dense regular connective tissue. The connective tissue that you see here is dense irregular connective tissue. These would all be collagen fibers, but unlike dense regular connective tissue, notice they don't run in a uniform direction. I can see these fibers going in many different directions. So it's not Regular, it's irregular, dense, irregular connective tissue. This happens to be a skin slide. A location for this is the dermis of your skin. We also find it encapsulating some organs in the periosteum around bones, perichondrium around cartilage. Not at all an uncommon way to package various organs in our bodies. It's dense, lots of fibers. It's irregular because the fibers run in many different directions. And notice, adjacent to this tissue, I have what? A little bit of adipose for a quiz. A little bit of adipose right there. So there we have a nice view right in the middle of the field. Dense, irregular connective tissue. Dense, irregular. So another view of this same tissue. Dense fibers running in all sorts of different directions. Dense, irregular connective tissue. It looks like quite a mess but then it's supposed to look like quite a mess. This tissue in the dermis of your skin 
specifically good at resisting stress from many different directions. So again, dense, irregular connective tissue. This tissue is the first of our two in lab cartilage tissues. The human body has three different kinds of cartilage in it, but only two of which you will see in lab, hyaline cartilage and fibrocartilage. This one is hyaline cartilage. This happens to come from a person's trachea. I can tell by the slide. But here's what I want you to key in on when you see a cartilage connective tissue. Look at these structures that you see here and here, here, these two right next to each other. I always tell people, and I think it's true, you can deny me but you're not here, so you just have to suffer through it. I always think that cartilage cells look like cartoonish eyeballs. You can see, let's take this pair right here, two circles, which are the chambers in which the chondrocytes, the cartilage cells, live. This chamber is called a lacuna, lacunae, plural, and inside is the cell, the chondrocyte, or chondroblast. So I always look for all these eyeball-looking cells. That's cartilage. As soon as you see them, you know you're looking at a slide of cartilage. Then the thing to ask yourself for lab is, do I see, do I see fibers or not? If I see fibers running through the eyeballs, it's fibrocartilage. If I don't, it's hyaline cartilage. In this case, I do not see any visible fibers streaming through this tissue, so this one is hyaline cartilage. I nickname it eyeballs in jello. They're in an extracellular matrix, which is sort of, you know, gelatinous in nature. It stains sort of this light purple color in this preparation, and I do not see any visible fibers. There might be a few fibers in a hyaline cartilage, but because of density things and staining, you normally don't see them. So eyeballs set into jello, hyaline cartilage. I'll say that again. Eyeballs in jello, hyaline cartilage. Where do we find this particular connective tissue? This is found at the ends of your long bones, it's around lunchtime, so let's talk food. If you eat a chicken leg, chicken wing, turkey leg, that little clear gelatinous cap on the end of a chicken leg or chicken wing bone, that's this stuff. Unstained, it looks clear. Hyaline cartilage at the end of long bones makes up your larynx found in your trachea and the embryonic or fetal skeleton. Typical locations for hyaline cartilage. Let's take another look at this one. Here's another very nice view of hyaline cartilage where I can see the lacunae and the chondrocytes very nicely a gelatinous matrix with no distinct visible fibers running through it. This slide's a particularly nice one. So I can see what? The lacuna and the chondrocyte here. So what are fair game questions for this tissue? I can ask you to name the tissue hyaline cartilage. Its type, connective tissue, one location, the ends of long bones, fetal skeleton. I could also indicate this chamber, a lacuna, or this cell, 
achondrocyte. Very, very nice hyaline cartilage. Now, as you look at different preparations of this tissue, you might see some that are a little more red, some that are a little more blue, some that are a little more green. This is one of the few times that the tech gets to be creative when preparing these slides. So I've seen these all sorts of different colors. So focus on the eyeball-looking chondrocytes in their lacunae and the fact that you do not see any distinct fibers in this tissue, hyaline cartilage. Here is the second flavor, if you will, of cartilage tissue you're responsible for in lab. Just like there were epitheliums that I cannot ask you because they were not in the first week's lab manual, there are cartilage tissues or a cartilage tissue that I cannot ask you because it's not included in your lab manual. So there are three different kinds of cartilage. Hyalin, we've already seen, fibro, this is, and elastic cartilage. Elastic cartilage is not included in this week's lab, so I may not ask you about that one on your quiz. Now, this is an example where your lecture professors as a group are taking it a little bit easy on you, though I know you don't believe it. It would be easy to confuse elastic cartilage with this one, so it's not included. If I had my way, I would have elastic cartilage in here and force you to do it. In fact, I even considered just inserting it in the lab anyway, but then I knew that somehow or other, virtually, all the other professors would gang up on me, so I resisted the urge. So here we have the only second type of cartilage I get to ask you about in lab, fibrocartilage. I can definitely see the chondrocytes in their lacunae, look at the eyeballs, and I can see fibers running through it. Look at these fibers that I see. So if I see the eyeball looking cartilage cells, I know it's a cartilage connective tissue. If I see fibers running through them, fibrocartilage. If it was a solid appearing gelatinous matrix, hyaline cartilage. If hyaline cartilage was eyeballs in jello, I call fibrocartilage eyeballs in a river. Let's take a look at another example of this same connective tissue found in the meniscus pads of your knee, your intervertebral discs, your pubic symphysis, fibrocartilage, a great shock absorber this tissue is. So let's take a look at another view of the same tissue. Okay, here is another view of fibrocartilage. I can see my chondrocytes living in their lacunae, and I think, I hope, the resolution is sufficient. You can see these fibers running this way. Fibrocartilage. Now, trust me, your quiz question, you'll be able to see the fibers if you know what to look for. So, fibrocartilage, eyeballs in a river. Okay, here's a third and I think another nice look at cartilage cells in a river, fibrocartilage. So look for these fibers amongst, between, in the extracellular spaces around these chondrocytes in their lacunae, fibrocartilage. Pubic symphysis, cartilage pads in your knee, the meniscus pads, and your intervertebral discs, shock absorbing tissue fibrocartilage. Okay, here we're looking at a very, very excellent slide of dense or compact bone. Bone tissue has a very distinctive look for it. In fact, I would say it's one of the three connective tissues that I call a 60 mile an hour tissue. Adipose is one, bone is the second, and blood is definitely the third. You can't really mistake this for anything else. And everybody says the same thing, looks like a target. 
Why do they say that? Because it looks like a target. Duh. So what we see in this picture is obviously a bullseye of the target, which is called the central canal. There would be blood vessels actually running in this thing out of the screen toward you and back behind the wall in this orientation in a living bone. In this preparation, all the living material is gone and they put ink, India ink through it, so it fills up with ink here, the empty chambers. So the central canal is the bullseye. These little spots you see here, which technically are lacunae, chambers where connective tissue cells once lived, this is where the osteocytes would be located. So on your lab quiz, if I point at the bullseye, central canal. If I point at these chambers within the rings of the bone, osteocytes. This is where we find the bone cells, osteocytes. And the entire target is called an osteon. Osteon is the entire target. Osteocytes would live here in these chambers. And central canal is the bullseye of the target. Now, contrary to what some people say, yes, you might notice that the target has rings in it. You cannot tell the age of a person by counting the rings in their osteons like you can tell the age of a tree by counting the growth rings. You can do that trick with some fish scales. Some species of fish count the rings in their scales to get their age. But guess what? This isn't a fish. So osteon is the target. Central canal is the bullseye. Osteocytes are here. Now, I only throw this one at you for lecture purposes when you get to lecture. Notice these small lines that appear like cracks. Those are canaliculi, tiny canals, where these osteocytes would get rid of waste, gain nutrients, communicate, etc. So those little cracks, think of those when you study bone in lecture. For lab, name the tissue, bone. Classify the tissue to its type, connective. Where do I find it? You only have 206 potentially correct answers. Your skeleton. And what are these? Osteocytes. What's the whole target? Osteon and the bullseye again, central canal. Very, I think, easy tissue to identify, dense bone. Here we have our last connective tissue. Again, a 60 mile an hour tissue. Easy to identify blood. The one mistake that students will always make on a quiz or a practical or a lecture test, hint, hint, for all of you, is they won't know how to classify this tissue. It's a connective tissue. So if I ask you to name this tissue, the name is blood. This is a blood smear. If I ask you to classify it as to its general type, it's connective. The cells are widely spaced. Lots of extracellular matrix, in this case, blood plasma. And it arises from your red bone marrow. It has all the characteristics of a connective tissue, but people always forget that. Common, common mistake. I will ask a student, what type of tissue is this? and they will say blood. Blood is not a tissue type. Remember, there's only four choices for that. Epithelium muscle, lab one, connective and nervous, lab two. So this one is a connective tissue. Now for this tissue, I can ask you to identify the various cells that you see in a blood smear. We have the most numerous red blood cells, erythrocytes. The less numerous white blood cells or leukocytes. And yes, you have to say leukocyte and erythrocyte. 
These three that you see here, large, staining, dark, are the white blood cells. And before you think to ask your lecture professor, why do we call them white blood cells when they're blue? They were white before we stained them. So they've been stained so that you can see them. Otherwise, they would appear clear on this white background. This one happens to be a monocyte, and here's a couple of lymphocytes that you see here. But for you, if I indicate this one, leukocyte, that one, leukocyte, you just name them by their group. So erythrocytes, the red blood cells, because of their hemoglobin content, they just appear red. White blood cells appear blue or purple or violet when they've been stained. Leukocytes. And then last but not least, I see these little things that look like fragments in this blood smear. I just selected a spot that has quite a few of them. These are platelets. Platelets. Sometimes called thrombocytes, but I don't like that name because they're not actually cells, they're cell fragments that assist us in clotting. Platelets right here. Now, occasionally I've been doing this thing long enough, a student looks at a blood smear, particularly across the hall in 224 lab, when they make a smear of their own blood, and the student sees platelets and they think they have a bunch of specks of dirt in their blood or some sort of pathogen. No, this is completely normal to see these. If you had little specks of dirt in your blood, you'd have a lot of cardiovascular issues, trust me. But these small cell fragments are platelets. Platelets, leukocytes, erythrocytes, blood, a 60 mile an hour connective tissue. What we're looking at here is our last tissue type and our last tissue slide. But don't get too excited because we have skin slides coming up later in this same lab. But this is nervous tissue. This is the only tissue where the type and the name are the exact same word. This is the only view of nervous tissue you will be responsible for knowing. So yes, I know connective is in the name of some of the connective tissues. I know the word epithelium is in the name of some of the epithelial tissues. But this one, if I say name the tissue, nervous. If I say give the type of tissue, also nervous. Very distinctive tissue. One tip a lot of students pick up on in a physically present lab this is one of the few tissues that looks best on low power rather than high power, which is the magnification I've been showing you all these tissues at. This one is only on low power because of the size of these cells. So take a look at this cell right here, and I want you to notice these distinctive looking projections that come off the cell. So nervous tissue has these very large cells with lots of projections coming off of them. And I want you to notice the darkly staining nucleus in this structure called the cell body, or perikaryon, which means area around the nucleus. So cell body, cell body, nervous tissue. Again, a very, very distinctive look it always looks pretty much like this. Where do we find this tissue? Well, making up our nervous system, obviously. Brain, spinal cord, nerves, and so on. Nervous tissue, let me just quickly pan to a slightly different view. So this is just a different spot on the same slide. Notice again the very, very distinctive look here, and I can see one large cell this being the cell body in this nervous tissue. This particular slide preparation is called a neural smash, where a technician takes some nervous tissue and just smashes it between two pieces of glass, little stain, voila, slide. So cell body in nervous tissue found in your nervous system. So you can see that I've laid out 10 boxes, 
one for each where I can draw my connective tissues and nervous tissue. Now I suggest that you go ahead and draw these with me in your lab manual. So break out those colored pencils, those markers, those crayons, what have you. I of course have my expensive whiteboard markers that I bought and again we're just drying out so I'm going to use that. Now the reason I draw these with you for these first two labs is not because I just want to use my markers and I like drawing. Who doesn't? But, but because I want you to understand that drawing many of these structures will help you learn them. This is procedural memory. So many of you might say to yourselves, oh yes, I'm a visual learner. Many of us are. But if you actually take an action, do something with this information as you study, that's going to help you a lot. If you're just kicking back right now watching these videos, you know, doing something like, dude, I just came back from the dispensary and I'm going to watch Dwayne draw these dishes. I'm going to chill out and eat some Cheetos. That's not going to work. You have to take some sort of action with this information. Use it in order to do well on the quizzes. So I'm going to draw these with you. But after this, for the following labs, I might advise you, I might show you just one thing to do, but draw some pictures, take some action, it's procedural memory. Be an active visual learner will probably help you more in lab than just sitting back and watching this like it's some sort of, you know, streaming entertainment. Because one, it's not that entertaining. And two, I guess you're watching it, but I don't know if I'd really say it's streaming because these are just a bunch of labs. But anyhow, let's get started with the first one. Areolar connective tissue. You might remember sometimes called loose, irregular connective tissue. It's got a bunch of fibers, I'll draw in collagens, that go a bunch of different ways. Some thin elastins as well. Areolar connective tissue with some fibroblast cells here and there throughout areolar connective tissue. Adipose. Looks like chicken wire. Looks like honeycomb in a beehive. The nuclei of the cells are shoved over to the side. 60 mile an hour tissue, nothing else looks like that one. Reticular connective tissue, famous for being dominated, of course, by this irregular network of reticular fibers, but oftentimes collecting in large bundles of reticular fibers, often stained blue or violet in color with usually a whole bunch of cells but still widely spaced. Don't confuse reticular connective tissue with areolar. A little bit of similarity but rewind and watch the video I think you'll see they're not that similar. You won't see those big collagen fibers as you do in areolar connective tissue. Dense regular connective tissue. A whole bunch of collagen fibers all basically go in the same way. Wavy hair. Something like this. No striations. Fibroblasts every once in a while, dense regular connective tissue. Dense irregular connective tissue would be this all messed up. If this is permed hair, then this is a messy bun, if I'm getting my hairstyles correct. 
as you might notice, that's not something I have to deal with. But I would have collagen fibers going all over the place. I don't see it as loose as areolar. This is much more dense, hence the name, with a couple of fibroblasts to keep me honest here. Now we get to our cartilage cells. Remember the goofy looking eyeballs which are lacunae with chondrocytes inside. See a little pair of eyes, very happy about, see, there we go. If it's hyaline cartilage, it looks like eyeballs in jello. So there's a matrix here, you'll learn about it in lecture, but I don't see any visible fibers. It's all one solid mass. Eyeballs in jello. I think you get the idea. Fibrocartilage, same cartilage cells. But now what do I see? Fibers. I will see visible fibers in fibrocartilage. Eyeballs in jello, eyeballs in a river. Bone, along with adipose, one of the easiest to identify. Remember, looks like a target. I really don't think you'll have too much trouble with this one. Hey, that's not actually too bad for me. Okay. Bone. Blood. Along with bone and adipose, the three 60 mile an hour tissues we have, Lots of erythrocytes. I think you get the idea here, and I'm tired of drawing erythrocytes. With maybe a few leukocytes. I'll just draw a big old monocyte right there for blood fans. Maybe a neutrophil over here. There's a lymphocyte. These are all leukocytes, white blood cells. And then a smattering of platelets, blood. There we go. And last but not least, nervous tissue. Nobody else looks like it. Large cells with many projections coming off of the cell body. Something like that. Maybe I'll draw another one over here. This is a happy cell right here. That's where he lives for the PBS fans of joy of painting. There we go. So nervous tissue or a neural smash. If I can draw these all in a few minutes, the idea is you draw these all, then draw them again, then draw them again, then watch the video. Don't just kick back and chill, dude. Take some action and draw these things out. It will make your life a lot easier, both for lab and for lecture. Okay, now in your lab manual, I want you to turn to page seven, where we have the skin anatomy models. 
I have many different versions of skin models. If I count them, because I can see them all right now, one, two, three, four, five, six different versions, not every model shows everything. That's the way anatomical models work. Some are a little better for one structure than another structure, so I'm going to point out these structures to you on the various models. You won't have to sit back and worry and wait for me to move the camera. I'll take care of all that in post-production. Yes, I did say that, post-production, like I'm some big filmmaker. But I can edit out a lot of the moving around and things like that and just show you what's important on these various models. So now that you've turned to page seven of lab number two, the first thing I want to do is on these models show you the difference between the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis on the left hand side of your lab manual. The epidermis is the uppermost layer of your skin or integument. It's right here. This is the epidermis between my thumb and my finger. I can tell where the epidermis starts because I see these little hills, which are papillae. A papilla, a single hill, like right here, that's a common term in anatomy describing anything that's a, a small little hill. Technically, it's anything that is nipple-shaped is a papilla. So I can see all these papillae here, plural, so they mark the difference between, or the boundary between, the dermis and the epidermis. So epidermis, and then below that, the dermis. These are the two primary layers of your skin. Anything below that is not skin, it's considered hypodermis. And I can always tell the hypodermis, look at the yellow, this is representing adipose cells. So the hypodermis or subcutaneous tissue dominated by adipose. Epidermis, dermis, hypodermis. Now let's look at the other models. Same thing can be seen on this model. First notice the papillae, not quite so pronounced on this one. Epidermis, dermis, adipose, the hypodermis. Epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. This particular model has very nice dermal papillae, I can see right here. I can also tell the difference between my epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. I'll say that again epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. This model, also very nice, dermal papillae, here, 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 epidermis, dermis, and the adipose, hypodermis. Epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. Hopefully by now you're getting the hang of this. Not too tough, I don't think. This one, much smaller scale. See the dermal papillae right there. Epidermis. Much bigger dermis and hypodermis. Epidermis dermis, hypodermis. One more model. This particular model has some very easy to identify papillae, epidermis above, dermis, and see where the adipose is, hypodermis. Hypodermis, dermis, 
epidermis. Now let's take a look, everyone, still on page seven, under the epidermis, the five strata or layers of epidermis that we have. So this is a pretty good shot of the epidermis on this particular skin model. This is all epithelium. This is a stratified squamous epithelium because the top layer of cells are flat. I've got a couple models that show the five strata nicely or the way I like. And since I'm the person here, these are the ones you will like as well. So let's start at the bottom with the single layer of cells on top of each papilla. See that? Just this single layer of cells right here is the stratum basale. One layer of cells, stratum basale. Right here, stratum basale. This whole pink region that I see here, and I can tell a little scrap of a label, somebody this semester asked this as a quiz question. Maybe I will too, I don't know. This layer right here, second one up, the stratum spinosum. Stratum spinosum. There's going to be a number of layers of cells, not just one. So the basale is one layer. Spinosum is right here. Those are the first two strata going up in your epidermis. The stratum granulosum, you can always tell on a model because they like to make it a little darker, maybe a little grainy looking. Right here, you can see this little darker layer it's only, you know, a few two, three, four layers of cells. Stratum granulosum is the next one, which is always a little darker. The cells there start to get visible grains inside their cytoplasm, inside the cell. So again, basale, spinosum, granulosum. Next up, you can see it here is shaded lighter. This is the stratum lucidum, the clear layer. Stratum lucidum, right here. Then everything superficial to that, everything above that is the stratum corneum. I'm gonna say it one more time on this model, work my way down, maybe just give you a little different angle on it, right here, stratum corneum, stratum lucidum, stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, and stratum basale, the five strata of the epidermis. Let's check out a different model, same layers. So here we have a different skin model, but still showing me the same five layers. Follow along with me. I can go relatively fast because you can just pause me or rewind me. Stratum basale. Stratum spinosum. Stratum granulosum, in yellow on this model, stratum lucidum, stratum corneum. We'll let it catch up with me focusing there. Corneum, lucidum, granulosum, spinosum, basale. This particular model does it 
quite nicely, I think, because they give me this nice white stratum lucidum, which in your skin would be clear in your thick skin that has that. So let's go from the top down this time, just for a little variation. The stratum corneum, the most superficial layer of us. This is what we see when we look at each other. Stratum lucidum, right here. Stratum granulosum, darker, which is very common. Stratum spinosum. And what's the very bottom layer called? Stratum basale, right? Stratum basale. So, three different versions showing me the five strata of the epidermis. Moving on, let's talk about some sweat glands. Let's talk about a few sweat glands in your integument. I can see both varieties here in this model. First, in white, I see one type of sweat gland. Those are called eccrine, or sometimes called merocrine, sweat glands. Here, 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 here. Eccrine sweat glands. All they release is sweat. This is the thin, watery sweat. I also see this larger, more serious looking sweat gland. This one is an apocrine sweat gland. So named, somewhat incorrectly, your lecture professors will tell you about it, because of what it releases. But the name has stuck. Apocrine sweat gland right here, bigger, larger duct, easy to identify. Eccrine sweat glands right here. Most models only show me these eccrine sweat glands. So you'll see them on various models. Only some models show me an apocrine sweat gland. Let's take a look at a few models. Notice this one shows me an eccrine sweat gland. Not really an apocrine sweat gland in this model. Here, a couple nice eccrine sweat glands. Notice they look sort of like a spaghetti noodle with the long noodle duct going all the way up to the surface where the sweat is released, like so. But eccrine sweat glands. And so is this one that you see way over here. That's not an apocrine sweat gland. Apocrine sweat glands need to be larger, much bigger. This particular model shows me both. Notice the eccrine sweat gland here and the bigger, larger ducted apocrine sweat gland right there. Eccrine sweat gland, apocrine sweat gland. Here we have two sweat glands, apocrine on the left and eccrine on the right, but I'm not crazy about this model because they look a little too similar for me, even though it's hyper accurate with the apocrine being associated with hair follicle, but not a view I use. Eccrine sweat gland right here. You see those over and over and over again. Now, we have another type of gland that's not a sweat gland in our skin. Notice this one. Notice this one actually attached surrounding a hair follicle, these are sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands, glands that produce hair oil. Sebaceous glands. Let me show you those on the other models. Very nice sebaceous gland right here. 
if you want a view of all three types of glands, eccrine sweat gland, apocrine sweat gland, and these two are sebaceous glands producing hair oil. Sebaceous gland, not that big, not that impressive on this model, but that's what it is. And a very nice sebaceous gland right here. Sebaceous gland. We also have two types of tactile sensory receptors that you need to know the names of, but they aren't too hard to identify one from the other. So the first one is called a lamellated corpuscle. I always like to go with lamellated as the name because it's got a bunch of lamella rings, circular rings. So this one right here, number 32 on this model, this is a lamellated corpuscle. They're always somewhat deep in the dermis. Lamellated corpuscle. Up here, nestled into a dermal papilla, which is where you find these, is what's called a tactile corpuscle. Tactile corpuscle right there. Lamellated corpuscle right here. Let's see these structures on different models. Lamellated corpuscle, notice the rings down in the dermis. Tactile corpuscles here, 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 nestled up in the papillae. A lamellated, again, rings corpuscle here, and tactile corpuscles here and here and here, up in the papillae. Look for those differences. Lamellated corpuscle, tactile corpuscle. Lamellated corpuscle, tactile corpuscles. I think you're getting it. One more. Lamellated corpuscle, Again, always look for those rings. Tactile corpuscle right here in the papillae. Sensory receptors, tactile receptors in your skin. Next up, we have some hair issues. Now, I can see two models at once here, and I do want to show you the difference between the shaft and the root of a hair. The shaft is the part of the hair that sticks up above the skin. So this is a hair shaft. Whoa, excuse me. This is a hair shaft. These are hair shafts. So the shaft of the hair is whatever sticks up above the skin. The root of the hair is whatever projects into the skin. So shaft versus root, know the difference. And the shaft, the actual hair, is composed of three layers, if you will. The medulla, the cortex, and the cuticle. Unfortunately, not every model shows perfectly these layers. So let's look a little closer down at the bottom of this particular hair's root. Okay. Now, this wide part at the bottom of the hair, from here to here, is called the hair bulb. Let's say that again. This wide part at the bottom of the hair, from here to here, 
is called the hair bulb. In the middle of that bulb is this upward projection where I typically see a couple capillaries go in, or a capillary go in, or a couple blood vessels go in, however you want to verse it in 223. This is the hair's papilla. So the hair papilla, not a dermal papilla. So I told you it was a common term. This is the hair papilla in the middle of the hair ball. Now on this particular model, I can see in this light color the medulla of the hair, the middle. Then the cortex, then the cortex, and the very outer part of the cortex is called the cuticle. The cuticle. Medulla, cortex, and cuticle right here. Let's look at another model that might show the medulla and the cortex a little better if I can lower myself. Okay, so a little lower view of this hair bulb. You can see the papilla right here. Now this structure right here is the hair matrix. That's not part of our lab. But what we want to look at is the way they've colored this model. In green, the middle is the medulla of the hair. And in white, we have the cortex of the hair. Medulla in green, cortex in white. And the outer layer of the cortex is the cuticle, right up here. Well, you can't see that in white. So notice up here, I can see that white cortex, the outer portion of which would be the cuticle. So medulla, cortex, and the outside of the cortex is the cuticle. This is the hair, but the hair has tissue layers surrounding it, namely three, an internal and external root sheath and a dermal root sheath. I'll say that again, an internal and external root sheath and a dermal root sheath. So again, this white is the cortex. Internal root sheath is yellow. External root sheath is, what would you call that? Sort of a pinkish, dull pink, rose, rose color maybe, how's that? And then in gray, the dermal root sheath. Dermal root sheath, external root sheath, internal root sheath, and then in white, I see the cortex, the outside of which is the cuticle. Dermal, external, internal. Start from the outside and count your way in. Dermal, external, internal. Now, not every model shows these very well, but I'm gonna show you the ones that are quiz worthy that I might use. So look at this particular model. I can see three layers, one labeled with a 13, one of 14, and one of 15. Dermal root sheath, external is 14, internal is this sort of yellowish line there, 15. Dermal, external, internal. Let me try to do even a little better photography work for you, if I can. Dermal is darker right there. 
dermal, external, internal. Did they see that? I can see the medulla, the cortex, and then the light or darker tan line is the cuticle. Lighter tan line, you can see, is the internal root sheath. Very nice on this model. If I was to look at one of these, oh, I can see a little bit here. I don't know if it's quite as nice. I can see the papilla and the bulb for sure. I can see medulla, this white line, and cortex, the dark. And then I can see, if I look closely, dermal root sheath here, external right there, and internal right here. But I don't know if it's quite as nice as that other model. Here's one that's very nice and I think easy to identify. Take a look at this one. So there's the actual hair. I'm tapping on the cuticle right there. This is the internal root sheath, external root sheath, dermal root sheath. So always start with the dermal on the outside and then count your way in. Dermal, external, internal root sheath like that. Hopefully that makes it a little bit easier for you. Maybe a little bit better. One more time. Dermal root sheath. External root sheath. Internal root sheath. And then there's the hair. Dermal root sheath in gray. External root sheath in brown, internal root sheath in gray again. Then I have the cortex and a massively big medulla on this particular model. So they don't all look exactly the same. In the practice section that comes after this, I will show you the ones that are very good and quizworthy. The other models, their hair layers aren't quite so good as these. Particularly good, this one. This one. And believe it or not, this one for the layers of the hair's root. The very last thing we have, which I think is pretty easy, would be these little bits of smooth muscle right there, the erector pili muscle. These muscles contract to make your hair stand up. Always very easy to identify on a model. Look at how big they make these things. I always laugh because when you see these on the microscope slide, they're nowhere near this big. Erector pili muscle. Every model has at least one. Erector pili muscle. erector pili muscle. Hopefully very, very easy for you on any of these models. And again, I'll mix these models up, use them in the practice section, so you just have some different things to look at and answer in the practice section of this lab. So this is a slide of human skin showing me the two primary layers of skin, your integument, this darker layer right here is the epidermis made up of five strata we'll go over in just a moment. 
Below this is the dermis, and at the top of the dermis, these hill-like projections that I see here are the dermal papillae. Dermal papillae here, dermis right here, and epidermis above with five layers or strata in it. We don't have any hypodermis on this particular slide, which will be visible as a bunch of adipose. Take a look. They just cut the tissue off here. So I'll find you one that shows me some hypodermis. This happens to be skin of the fingertip. I know that because I see this relatively clear looking layer right here called the stratum lucidum, which we have on our fingertips, toes, soles of our feet, palms of our hands. You'll learn all about that in lecture, thick skin. But this is the first microscope slide for the human integument skin that we are looking at in lab to identify the five layers or strata of human skin. So on those specific parts of your body that have all five layers of skin or epidermis that we call thick skin. So if you have all five layers of epidermis, that's called thick skin. And the five layers are, follow along in your lab manual, always have that handy so you can follow along with me. Starting at the bottom, right here where my finger runs, the very bottom layer of the epidermis is called the stratum basale. This is just one layer of essentially cuboidal cells. So the very bottom layer where it goes from dark to light here in this tissue, this is the, the border between the epidermis and the dermis. These little hills, light colored hills you see are the dermal papillae. So the stratum basale is the single layer of cells right under my finger, right here in this slide, stratum basale. The stratum spinosum, this much thicker pinkish layer right here where my finger runs, the stratum spinosum is the second stratum going up. So stratum basale at the bottom, stratum spinosum right here. Then you can see where these little dark spots are these little dark grains. You'll get to learn what those are in your lecture, of course. But these signify the stratum granulosum, the grainy layer. That's always a pretty good landmark to use with the slide or the models. Stratum granulosum right here where my finger is. Then this clear layer, which appears to split right here, which it often does when you smash the skin between two pieces of glass, this is the stratum lucidum, the clear layer. Stratum lucidum, only present in thick skin. And then everything above that that gets a little darker up there, stratum corneum which is what you see when you look at me, what I see when I look at you. So again, five strata or layers of the epidermis. Let's do it from the top down this time. Stratum corneum, stratum lucidum, stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, and at the very bottom, single layer of cells, stratum basale. The five strata of epidermis in 
thick skin. So here I have another skin slide, this one showing me a bunch of hairs. Hair shaft, what you see projecting above the skin. Hair root, what goes below the skin into the dermis. Now, as long as I'm here, let's take a look at a couple structures we see right here right here and right here. I want you to look at this diagonal line that appears very dark going down. I'll zoom in on it for you. See that diagonal line running down? I can see several of them here. Don't know if I can do the camera work, so bear with me everybody. Here's one right here see this one right there another one right here a very nice one right there those are erector pili muscles those structures are erector pili muscles which pull on the hair follicle to stand the hair up. When they pull on the hair follicle, they yank down on your epidermis creating goosebumps appearance. But these are the erector pili muscles, nowhere near as large as they look on those models, are they? Now, oh yeah, if you attached a little dumbbell to your hair and you were able to, you know, do some exercise and pump it up. Maybe you could build that thing up, but it's smooth muscle, so you can't really do that. So, nowhere near as big as they look on the models, but then we don't need that muscular effort to move one hair. So, hair shaft and follicle, the erector pili muscle, from your list, you need to know that erector pili muscle you need to know the hair shaft and down at the bottom let me move this up I can see very obvious hair bulbs so erector pili muscle hair bulb hair shaft sticking out above the skin and also on this slide if I go down a little farther, I can see hypodermis, which is a bunch of adipose right here. So right where this adipose is, so this is hypodermis, this is dermis, epidermis is up there with the hair shaft sticking out from it. Here we're looking at a little chunk of human scalp kind of oily scalped once in a while, we humans. So I can see my epidermis and my dermis. See those dermal papillae there once again. And the reason I picked this slide of the scalp is because it typically has very good sebaceous glands. That's what these structures are. These are sebaceous glands or oil glands that make hair oil sebum and they tend to be attached to hair follicles. This one's cut so you can't see it, but all of these things that you see right here, I think they sort of look like little bunches of grapes or something. Those are sebaceous glands. And I can also see some merocrine sweat glands in this slide as well. So come down below this sebaceous gland and I see merocrine sweat glands. Merocrine or ecrine, interchangeable terms. I know they're listed as two separate things in the lab manual. Don't get hung up on that. Merocrine sweat glands. And then here's some hypodermis down there. So merocrine sweat glands sebaceous glands. Notice the difference in their appearance. 
Make sure you're keeping track of that.